All right, you guys can be seated. If the kids want to head back with Mr. David and Miss Jill. Those that got baptized today, see me afterwards because I have your uh, certificates. So don't forget because I probably won't remember next week. So last week we finished up our sermon series, Faith Under Fire, and I want to, some of you might think this is a recap, but uh, this is an important foundation. And so I really want to dig in the next couple weeks on the family, on the community that God has given us. So we're starting a new sermon series called Church Community or Church Family. The church is a community of people working together. We are all in this for the same reason, to please God, to grow in our relationship with him. As such, this is the series that's going to challenge us, the church, to grow, to give back to God what he has already blessed us with. We're going to be thinking about togetherness, leaning on each other, the church working together for a common goal and purpose, working together so others can be blessed, so that others can come to know Christ. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for every person that's here in this magnificent day that we got to share with uh, Ellie and Calvin as they, uh, they showed the world that they are following you, Lord, and I am just over the moon today. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray that these words be yours and not mine. I pray that you would open up hearts and minds today. I pray that you would bless our tithe and offering and that we would be good stewards of it. And Father, I pray for the ones that are watching online, Lord, that, uh, that couldn't be with us today, that you would watch over them and bless them. And Father, I pray, I pray for every pastor out there today, every church that is preaching biblical truth, Lord. I pray that you would just give them boldness I pray that you would give them the strength and the courage to bring forth your message because you have laid it upon their hearts to deliver today. Father, we thank you and you get all the glory and the praise and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, we're gonna be in Acts chapter two, verse 42 through 47. Um, Like I said, some of this you might think, well, we've heard him talk about it before, but I'm telling you, Just like scripture, I could read it a thousand times and a thousand times I learned something new and a thousand times God speaks to me in another way. So good foundation, guys. So come to this humbly and let God speak to you today. So in Acts chapter two, verse 42 through 47, they devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with, God, with glad and sincere heart, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. I don't remember, I don't know if you remember, probably not long after I started, we went through the whole book of Acts, right? And I told you when we got to Acts chapter two, this particular verse, this is the kind of church I want us to be. I want us to be an Acts two church where we come together, we break bread with each other, we grow together, we become a family so that we can serve and bless others. When Peter first preached about 3,000 were saved. Now, probably more than 3,000 because in that time they did not count women and children. So, guesstimate, right? Probably a lot more than 3,000 at that time were saved. These were new Christians, developed groups. They developed fellowship with each other, with those around them. The believers took them in. The, the, the more mature Christians, the one that had already been saved, they took them in, they welcomed them, they became part of their family. And they grew in their relationship with God and with each other. Like I said, they became a family. 
a family that wanted to please God for all that he had done for them, for this amazing gift of salvation. This was the first church. They saw the importance of of being in church, being in groups, and around other believers that would encourage them, challenge them, and help them grow. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, guarantee you're all like, we got to hear this one again, but it's one of my favorite verses. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The truth is, we can try to do life together. Or we can try to do it alone. I've heard it all from, I don't have to go to church to be saved. No, you don't. Just because you come to church doesn't mean you're saved. I've heard, uh, the church is full of hypocrites. I'm going to tell you, we're all sinners. You best believe there's hypocrites in the church. You best believe that there are broken people in the church. And you best believe that this is a hospital for sinners. You might hear or might be thinking, that sermon did not speak to me. That music, I couldn't, it's not worship music to me. How are you approaching the word of God, though? Are you humbling yourself before it and saying, God, I'm, yeah, I've maybe heard this sermon before. I've maybe heard all these scriptures before. Are you coming to God saying, just speak to me today? Or are you coming in? I know that. I know everything he's going to say. It's all about how you approach it, right? Worship, you might not like the music. I can't please everyone, right? But what I do is I pray through the music. And if we had a worship team, they would be praying through the music and working alongside me, right? That's what happens in those big mega churches, hopefully. But see, I pray through everything we do and I, because I want to be in God's will and someone needs to hear it. And when you're worshiping, I don't care what the music is. It shouldn't matter. I make sure the music glorifies God and points to him. And that is all that matters because it is, that worship time is between you and God, lifting your hands to Jesus and saying, you saved me. You give me grace. You've given me a new life. My sins are forgiven. And I have a new life to live in you. It is just a thankfulness, a connection between you and God. And it doesn't matter about the music. See, all of these things that I mentioned, now you don't have to be saved to go to church. You know, if you go to church, you're not saved. There's people in here that are broken, every one of us, even me. People will let you down in this church. I will let you down. You will let me down. It happens. Different personalities clash together. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> me and Jenny, we are completely two different personalities, and we butt heads, Right? Most of the time, I say you win. But the point is, is we're doing life together, and life is messy. Life can be messy. But we are supposed to walk it together. All these things are true, but when you, we are stronger together. A family here to help each other along through life. Now, when you're alone, you're vulnerable. You think of pack animals, killer whales. I, for some reason, I'm really obsessed with killer whales on YouTube. I don't know what it is. I enjoy watching. They flipped a a stingray like 100 feet in the air with their tail. It was amazing. But, getting off track here, but they, they, they call them a pod, right? They're a pack. Together, they're weak. They probably couldn't hunt the way they do. They probably couldn't take down giant whales by themselves. But together, they can take down anything in the ocean. Now, if you look at our world today, if you turn on the news, it's nothing but horrible stuff. Our government's in shambles, the world's in shambles, 
everything's just kind of out there. Together, we're vulnerable. But united together as a community, as a family, we are strong. And we can take a stand against things that we don't, that Scripture tells us is not right. Right? Like I said, we're all sinners. This is a hospital for sinners. In addition to that, we're all at different stages of our, of our walk. Each and every one of us. There might be one that just got saved. They're just starting out. There might be some that are more mature and they're able to, to run full sprint, trust God in everything. We're all at different stages. One can help the other. Discipleship, we can help the other. And eventually, that person you're discipling, that you're like, oh, well, they were, they're so new. Eventually, they'll start discipling you and they'll start bringing people in to disciple. We each have abilities and we're given talents to use. So no matter where you're at in your walk, it doesn't matter, you're part of the family. And like I said before, I don't care how old you are, you can be 85 years old and just come to Christ today. But there's a place for you in the family of God. Again, we must remember that we are all in different places and in our different walks of life. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23 through 24, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. We all fall short. We all mess up. We all fall short of the glory of God. What the church here is for, to help you, to help you grow, to help you mature in your walk, to disciple each other, to encourage each other. And I pray that you're challenging each other. And I also pray that you're keeping each other accountable I know that's not easy, right, to tell someone, hey, this, this ain't right. Let me show you what God says. Now, I tr I'm, I'm going to trust that you build a relationship with that person before you do that. But the church family is here to encourage, challenge, support, lean on, and to keep each other accountable. If the first church saw how important this was, to gather together, to be together, and you best believe they were challenging each other, you best believe they were worshiping with each other, breaking bread with each other, keeping each other accountable, challenging, helping each other, encouraging each other. If they took it so seriously and they saw the importance in it, and God blessed that church, that first church, so much that Christianity spread like a wildfire, then shouldn't the church today Take it serious too. How many of us, you can keep this to yourself, do you think coming to church in groups and being connected with other believers is important? Do you take it serious? Let me put it this way. There's 52 days, 52 Sundays in a year. 52 out of 365. Maybe two hours out of that day, if I'm short-winded. <laughs> right? You have six other days. Maybe you come to a group. Right? We'll, we'll throw in a group. Maybe you come during a week. Maybe there's a group starts. You come during church week. Maybe one hour. You're maybe spending three to four hours out of your week with other believers, with your church family. You spend more time at work. I guarantee you spend more time on your phone. You spend more time watching TV. Here's another thing. How many, how many love Ohio State? Like, every, like everyone, right? If you had tickets to Ohio State game, You'd make that a priority, wouldn't you? Saturday, that's when they usually play, right, Saturday? Not a big football guy. Don't hurt me later. 
Saturday they play. If you had tickets, your back hurts, would you go? Would you still go? Headache, footache? If the coach of your kid's basketball team said, hey, we're having practice this day and you had Ohio State tickets, would you say, I can't because I've got to go to the Ohio State game? That's a tough one, ain't it? But you probably would, right? How many, of, how many people do you think would do that for church? And would you do that for church? Would you say, if your kid has a basketball game and you go up, would you go up and tell the coach, we're not going to make it? Well, why not? We have church. And that's more important. Family coming in. We dragged my mother-in-law here today, by the way. <laughs> Family coming in. Most people would think, well, I can't go to church today because I got, I, got, I got guests in the house. can't leave them. Drag them to church. If they won't come with you, set the example. Go to church anyway. If you're out of town, I know people go on vacation. If you can't make it to this church, find a church to visit. Be a witness. Show people that church is important to you, that growing is important to you, that coming together is important to you because the first church saw the importance of it. They saw how important it was. Let me tell you, right now we have a cushy because um, there was a picture that aired not like last month of they believe which is the site of the first church. And it is a hole in the ground with rocks everywhere. They sit on slabs and floor and dirt. Y'all get some, I don't say they're comfortable, but they're cushy pews. Ain't them old wooden ones, right? Is church important enough? Because we all know most people, if they had high state tickets, they would go. No excuses. But when you wake up in the morning, are you making excuses not to go to church? Not to be around other believers? Think about things that you absolutely love. Do you make excuses not to go to those? Probably not. Like I said, most people spend more time playing on their phones, watching TV, when you could be connecting with other believers, growing in relationship with Jesus. So after all this, after the first church would meet, they would grow with each other, they broke bread, they studied the word of God. What did the first church do after that? Because we're not just supposed to come and meet and that's it. Church is for you to grow and for you to serve and give back what God has already given you, right? The first church, as they grew, got a servant's heart. They got a servant's heart. They gave of themselves, their time, their talents, their finances, possessions. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, it says, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I have lived among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go, tell this people. Here we see Isaiah. He is in a vision, standing before the mighty God, standing before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, standing there witnessing his amazingness, his awesomeness, right? And he says, I don't deserve to be here. I'm unclean lips. I don't deserve to lay eyes on him. And what happens? 
the, the seraphim comes over and he atones and God forgives him of his sin. His sin was atoned for. Each one of us, when we give our lives to Christ, our sin is wiped clean, slate clean, washed white by the blood of Jesus. What is your response to that? And it's not a one-time response. What is your response to that? Is it, thank you and I go about my day? Or is it, here I am, Lord. Send me wherever you see fit. Whatever church body you want me a part of, whatever serving you want me a part of, whatever you ask me to give, here I am. I will trust in every part of it. We all know, and we're going to touch on this more, but we all know that God tells us if we're not giving 10% of our finances that we are robbing God. And that when we do give 10%, that he will open the floodgates of heaven and pour out more blessings than what you can hold. The only area he says, test me in this. What is your response? Are you going to be like the first church and say, I'm here to give my time, my talents, my possessions, and I'm willing to do whatever you say I need to do, God, because I trust you and I am so thankful for the salvation that you have given me, the sin that you have atoned me for. What's your response to him? Isaiah 6, 5 through 9, it's one of my favorite scriptures, and I spent probably two months this past couple months reading it over and over and over again. Isaiah was so thankful for salvation and being forgiven that he said, basically, whatever you want, Lord, whatever you would have me do, whatever you would have me give, I trust you, and I'm so thankful for this gift of salvation that I'm willing just to be used. He saw what God had done for him. And some of the ways that we can thank God is to worship. Is to worship together, come together. And then giving of our time, our talents, and our possessions. In Luke chapter 12, verse 48. But the one who does not know and does things deserve, deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Has God not given us another day? We all woke up this morning, breath in our lungs. Has he not given you everything that you have? Has he not given the car that you drove in here on? In, not on, in. Hopefully it was in. The house, the food, the money, anything and everything, the clothes on your back, has he not provided that for you? The job that you have. I could go on and on. Has he not given you everything that you need? Has he not blessed you in some way? All these things that we have is because of God. There have been times when our family, we thought, I don't do much of the bills, Jenny does. But she tells me, hey, we, there's been times that we didn't know where anything was, how we were going to pay something or how something was going to get fixed or how we were going to make ends meet. I don't know what that was. But I'm telling you, even in those times, God provided a way. Every single time. And even when we knew that we weren't going to have money to pay something, we made sure we give our 10%. And I'm not up here for a spokesperson for the church saying, give, give, give. I don't want you guys to think that. I'm telling you to give back to God because what we do with it is we keep up this building and we do ministry to further his kingdom. Believe it or not, sometimes that takes money. God always provides. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean, onto your, lean not on your own understanding. 
In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Sometimes it won't make sense. Sometimes when you get, to, when you get your paycheck for the week or the month or whatever, and you're like, oh, I got to tithe my 10%, and you're looking at your bills, and you're like, this makes no sense how this is going to work. Do it anyway. Lean on his understanding. Because I'm telling you, by the end of the month, you're going to be like, God, I don't know how you did it, but you did it. There's going to be times that it doesn't make sense to other people either. When we came up here, it made sense to no one. But I know God's trustworthy. I know his character because I can read it and I can get face to face with him in scripture. I've seen him provide for me day after day. And I know that he's got, he's there for me. And if I just am obedient and I trust in him, that he will provide for my family and me. So even if, if it doesn't look right on paper, if it doesn't look good to others, and you're sitting there thinking, this doesn't look right, trust that God knows best. He knows how to provide for you. He knows exactly what you need. It might not always come the way you want it to come, but he will provide. In Proverbs 11, chapter, or I'm sorry, chapter 11, verse 24, one person gives freely yet gains even more. Another withholds undoubtedly, but get comes to poverty. The first church was so thankful for the gift of salvation, and they wanted to be used by God. So they gave of their time, talent, and finances, and they did that, and they were able to, Not only because they read scripture and had a personal relationship, but because others in the church challenged them, encouraged them, and they also, when you come to church, guess what? You get to see the blessings. You get to see blessings that God bestows on other people. Maybe you get to be a blessing to one of those people. Being like the first church and coming together Giving is a way of showing our love for God. Going to church is an expression of our love for God. It is where we gather together publicly to show our faith that we trust God, that this is what we put our hope in, our faith in, something that is required of all Christians. The church is also where we can praise, thank, and honor the Father. I'm going to give you a few reasons. Well, I'm sorry. Here's, let's do this story first. Here's a short story that I found. I have no idea who the author is, but it says, I, do not, I don't go to church anymore. They're all hypocrites, Tara said to Pastor Tim. On more than one occasion, Pastor Tim had heard this sort of comment. He'd be first to agree the church is made up of people who were not perfect. Neither was he for that matter. But each time Pastor Tim heard such comments, his heart would break because he knew the incredible value of doing life together with the body of Christ. Pastor Tim had long ago learned how Satan uses people and circumstances to disappoint Christians and pull them away from the very people God would use to bless, train, and encourage them at church. But recognize the enemy's schemes did not ease the sorrow of his or any other pastor's heart for his people. I don't want you here because I want numbers. I will be the first to tell you I care less about numbers. I want you here because it's important. We only get so long on this earth. We know that not everyone's going to be saved and go to heaven. But I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to give God everything I have, every fiber of my being, to make sure I reach as much people as I can. To tell them the truth and the hope of Christ that I have, the joy that I have. I want you here because I care about you. Because when the end of days come, When we all get called to heaven, I want to be up there worshiping with you. I don't want to be ascending and seeing you down here on the ground. 
When you're apart from the body, you're vulnerable. We can think we're as strong as we want to be. Most men are brought up to think that we don't show emotions, that we're supposed to be this strong figurehead. I'm here to tell you, we're, we're not that strong. None of it. No one is. Together, there's strength. In unity, there's strength. When I hear these things of people making in, in excuses, and that's what they are, is excuses. You can see people grasp for them. They grasp for these excuses not to come to church. But I don't see them grasping for excuses to miss a football game. To miss phone time or TV, a movie they wanted to see. But yet we will give up meeting together, growing with Christ. Eternity is a long time. You can't do it alone. We are to walk life with each other, to grow with each other, to challenge each other. So I'm going to ask you again. Is God at the top of your life or is something else? Because if God's at the top of your life, I bet you I see you here every Sunday. Now, if you're sick, stay home. I don't want it. You can watch online. <laughs> But if you're physically able to be here, be here. You're never really that busy. Something can always give. There's a lot of good things that we can make excuses for. Like I said, attending your kids' soccer games, basketball games, uh, family getaways, fixing stuff around the house. Uh, weekends away, doing things that you just want to do. Those are, those are not bad things. They're not. But remember what I told you too is, if one, we're a pack. We're uni- if we're united, we're strong. Together, you're we- or alone, you're weak. And it's a slippery slope. When you miss a Sunday, it just starts going. Before you know it, I haven't seen you in a year. Also, if we're to be witnesses to the world, no matter where we are, being a witness is making God a priority. Oh, I've got family and I don't have time for a Bible, reading my Bible. You better make time because that's witnessing. Well, they're here on a Sunday. I can't go anywhere. You better go somewhere. I'm out of town. I don't know any of these churches. If you're away from a, you can't get to a church, We stream online. 90% of the churches do. You can find something to watch. Not only that, but in America, there are churches on every corner. Find one. Look them up online. Look at their doctrine. See what's close. What preaches, preaches good biblical doctrine. And go visit it. Show them that God's a priority in your life. Don't be a captive to activities around you or over what God says is more important. He tells us in Hebrews 25, do not give up, do not forsake the gathering of others, guys. Come on. It's not that much time out of your day, out of your week. It's very small. Going to church is not about getting your attendance gold star. I'm not handing them out. Right? I'm not going to hand you a gold star at the end of the service. It's not about checking the box and say, well, I did my God thing for the week. I'm done. I don't want you to be a Sunday warrior either. Nor is it about getting God's favor for the week because you assemble together. God loves it when we gather together, but if that's the only reason you're going to say, look at me, God, I went to church. You need to come in here with humble hearts. Church is not a place to go. Rather, it is a living body where God wants you to become a part. 
for your good and for God's glory. It's not just a place. We are the church. So what's some reasons why to go to church? Number one is to hear the preaching of the word. If the word of God is quick, powerful, and sharper than a sword, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 tells us, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the, I'm sorry, penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Because of this hearing, the preaching of Scripture is vital to your spiritual well-being. Guys, this is why I don't just tell stories up here. I pack it full of Scripture because, most importantly, I want you to hear the Word of God. Now, the bits in between, God gives me those words, but most importantly, I want you to go home and I want you to study these Scriptures. Really study them. Like I said, watching, watching preachers on TV is often how people justify going to church. If you're physically unable to get here, I completely understand. Watch online. That's what it's there for. If you're out of town and you're on vacation, say you're at a cabin, that's the only way you've got to get to do church, then do church that way. But if, if you're able to make it here, if you're physically able to get in this building and do church with a body of believers, I promise you, you will be blessed. And I'm not knocking the TV and the streamers. They, they're probably good preachers. But without living in close fellowship with real people, you can never really experience the help and hope Christ offers his bride through faithful involvement in your local church. I will say this, though. Like I said, if you physically can't get here, that's the only way you got, then watch it. You're getting fed one way or the other. When, I'm going to use David and Jill, when they're back there and they're missing this, I hope Monday or tonight, whenever, that they watch service online because they missed it. For me, I, I can't really feed myself, can I? I mean, I get stuff out of my sermons, but it's not my studies. Mondays, I watch. Mondays or Tuesdays, I watch other, other churches. I got to get fed too. I don't, I don't tell you guys anything that I don't do myself. Church is important. Online is a wonderful resource. But even at that point, if you physically get AAB here, I still want you connected. Reach out. Reach out to the church because you can be active and involved even though you watch online. And if you know of someone that just watches online, tell them they can get involved. Trust me, there is tons of stuff. If you want to serve, there is tons of stuff that I could certainly pass on. If you like administration, come see me. I got all kinds of it. And I hate it. Worst part of the job. Maybe, I don't know, maybe sooner or later we start an online Bible study. There is many different ways to get connected, even if you can't be here. Even if there's someone watching online. Now I expect, because you're all here, that you can get here. So you best be here next Sunday. Don't take it as an excuse. But for those people, if you know people are watching online, there are ways for them to connect, especially if the church, like us, that serm, their, do their sermons online weekly. This, when we do this, when you stay connected, it allows us to stay in communion with your church, your church family, learning what they are learning and growing as they grow. These days, people are getting their information through hearing what they want to hear, though. This is why I tell you, you've got to really be careful what you watch. What church people go to. Because people, 
The information is really what they want to hear. So sadly, more and more preachers are replacing preaching with pleasing. They please them to keep their butts in the pews. God never instructed his ministers to entertain the troops. Rather, he commanded them to preach truth with urgency. Now, I've told you time and time again, I'm not up here to please you. I'm not up here to tell you what you want to hear. I'm up here to tell you what you need to hear. I'm up here to preach the word of God, and I'm not going to apologize if God's word makes you unhappy. Because if you're feeling like I just upset you about anything that I said, then you're probably being convicted. The next step is what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with that conviction? Do you know what I, and this, this is kind of an off topic, but what I always tell people is when I first got saved, I, I really told God I would mess up. I, you know, I was there, I was new, and I'd skip church sometimes. Oh, I'm so tired, I work third shift. It was hard, super hard. We went to the 9 a.m. service. It was, oh, it was awful. Once I got there, I loved it. But getting there is the hard part sometimes, right? But I used to tell God, and, and this still goes for today, I always tell God each and every day, God, if you need to convict me, you convict me like a punch in the gut. I want you, I want to know it. I want to feel it. I want you to take me down to my knees and say this is wrong. This is not what you need to be doing. And I entrust that people that preach, and I, I, I expect you guys, that's why we give you the scriptures. Double check. Don't take what I say for, for anything. Double check what I say. I'm human. I make errors. By the way, last week, here's an error. I said Romans 19. It was Revelations 19. There's an error for you. You can check. <laughs> Only one person caught that, by the way. Double check what I say. Double check what everyone says. We're human. We make, we make mistakes. For that one, I had Romans in my head. I don't know why, but it came out on paper. But I'm not up here to soft preach. Because like I said, I don't, I'm not going to stand before Jesus and he's not going to sit there and tell me, hey, you were supposed to be teaching this and you taught that sin was okay. You ain't going to hear me say that. I'm not standing before Jesus taking that. Because when I, when I get face to face with Jesus, I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You might not like everything I say, but I'm telling you, I... I dig into God's word, and I take each and every Sunday. It's important to me. I take it serious. A couple weeks ago, I, I told you guys that I, I leave out of Sundays feeling like I, I didn't do a good enough job. And it, it sucks. It does. But you know what? I wouldn't change it. Because it keeps me humble. because there's room for me to grow. We're forever learners. And I want to do the best that I possibly can for God. And God has entrusted me with this church and with, this, with, with you guys, this congregation, to help you, lead you to Christ. And for me, that is serious. That is important to me. Each one of you, whether you've been here one time or you come regularly. I don't care if you visited one time you were prayed for. Watching online, you're prayed for. I pray for you guys each and every week, every single day, part of my prayer time. We can't sit here and sugarcoat the word of God. He instructed preachers to, treat, to preach with truth and urgency. And I... Ch if you're visiting today and you feel like, and I don't care if someone's watching online and they're just watching online and they go to another church, the best thing you can ever do is to look at their doctrine 
Make sure it's biblical. And if you know a friend that's not going to a biblical church, pray to God and ask him, how can I show them that they need to be in a church that does? God has entrusted me and so many other pastors with preaching and teaching his word, and we should take it serious. One of the first things I told my board when I started here is you keep me accountable. That was my number one. Keep me accountable. Because I'm human, I'm broken, I fall short of the glory of God all the time. You can ask anyone I meet with, I usually don't sugarcoat anything. Might not like what I have to hear, what I have to say, but they, it's because I love them and I want to see you guys grow. Like I said, I will not apologize for what God says is truth and right. And when, peop- when pastors are speaking truth, even you guys, when you tell someone after you have a relationship, make sure you have a relationship, it's what community is about, relationships. When God tells you it's time to speak truth in that person's life, remember that God has entrusted you with that. He has entrusted you to speak truth and scripture into their life. It is through preaching of sound doctrine that comes directly from the word of God, of which penetrates hearts and transforms lives, calls sinners to repentance, encourages the down and out, inspires the Lord's servants to love and to serve Christ, lights the way God would have you go. When facing certain death, the Apostle Paul revealed the importance of preaching with this instruction in Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. The best advice that I was ever given, and I will ever give anyone, and it was, by, I kid you not, this, her name is Miss Peg. She's this tall. She is the tiniest little thing you've ever seen. But when it comes to God and sharing God, she's fierce. She doesn't hold back. This is what she told me. Preach the word, love the people. When we go out of these doors and we meet the mission field, or we have someone come in here, Preach the word and love the people. Love the person, hate the sinner. Or, I'm sorry, love the... Love the sinner, love the sinner hate, hate the, the sin. sin. My goodness, I, I, it was right there, I promise. <laughs> Woo, there's another error. Told you I mess up. Goodness gracious. Wow. It's been happening to me all week. I can't talk. Whew. Next, the next thing, the reason why we should go to church, is to participate in corporate worship. Worshiping God alone is wonderful. It's great. I do it all the time. Sometimes, I, as Teresa might know, I sing in the stores to embarrass Lily. Not realizing I'm going to see people that I know. That's going to come back to bite me. Worship, worshiping by yourself it's wonderful. We should. Trust me, when people see me in the car, they probably think I'm nuts. <laughs> but nothing can replace the beauty of coming together corporately to worship with others. You ever, you ever just, when we're worshiping in here, you ever just listen and kind of drown out the music that's playing and listen to the body of Christ just singing? That warms your heart. And if it warms our heart, think of what it does for God. To see his people putting things aside, coming together to just praise and honor him. Being thankful for this gift of salvation. It's amazing to come together with people that have his spirit in them through the redeeming work of the salvation of salvation. 
Jesus said, those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. And John 4, chapter, or sorry, verse 24 says, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in the truth. In order to truly worship God the way he demands, you are required to do some soul searching. All too often people think worship is rooted in a feeling These are these things that I like to call spiritual highs. We've all had them. They're they're amazing, right? Wonderful day. That sermon really spoke to me today, and I just, I could feel everything, and I could just, or the music, everything was just perfect. I'd say not every Sunday is going to be like that. Not every Bible study is going to be like that. When there's spiritual highs, there's spiritual lows, too but it's how we approach them. You know what happens when those spiritual highs happen is, sadly, if the church doesn't continue to create that environment that brings that emotion, that spiritual high out, that person will move on and find another church. Or worse, they'll stop coming altogether. Not everything in a sermon or in the music is going to give you this spiritual high. You might think that, you might be sitting there a day and think, Pastor Shane, I've heard all this stuff before. I know it all. You ain't telling me nothing I ain't never heard before. I'm here to tell you that people have been preaching for 2,000 years. I ain't telling anyone they ain't not heard before. But it's important. Because God can speak to you. But if you ain't here, he ain't going to speak to you. If you come with a wall up saying, I don't need to hear what he has to say. I've heard it all before. And you don't come in here humble thinking, God, just speak to me today. How's he going to get through? Because you just put a wall up. Everything's got to be a heart response. I'm here to tell you that we are all in need of a reminder of foundations. I could go back here. I could leave here right now and go back to kids' church and sit and listen, whatever they have to say, and I guarantee I'm going to learn something. There's always something to learn. There's always something to be reminded of because if we're not reminded, we take it for granted. We need to be reminded of the foundations and many other things. Maybe today's sermon didn't speak to you. But like I said, that one you missed because that one didn't speak to you. You're like, I'm not going this Sunday because that one didn't speak to me. God can't talk to you at that one. Realize that worship, worshiping God comes as a response of our humble gratitude for his love for us. Knowing God and his character as revealed in Scripture will stir in his children a heart of thankfulness that is expressed in worship that brings him glory rather than self-serving emotional experience. And ain't that what we want to do? We want to glorify God in everything we do. The Spirit causes true worshipers to long to come together with other believers to honor Christ. If God's Spirit doesn't stir in you a desire to worship God both privately and corporately, it's time to get on your knees and pray, guys. The next, the next reason why you should be in church is because iron sharpens iron. This is what Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17 tells us. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Meeting regularly with other believers is a source of encouragement and strength. But know this, when iron rubs with iron, it not only makes it sharper, but it also flings sparks. Sparks happen. We all have different personalities. You are going to bump head with someone. It's going to happen. Work it out. Life is too short to be angry at a believer. 
or with anyone, truthfully. If you and your spouse get in a fight, do you just leave it? Now, I can't, I can't do that. If, I get in a, if someone upsets me or I upset someone, I'm a fixer. I, I love to, I got to fix it. Sometimes Jenny just needs me to stay away. And I can't do that because I'm like right up in her business. <laughs> what can we do to fix this? We need to fix it. It makes it worse. It makes it, sometimes it makes it, gets me in a lot of trouble. But listen, guys, we, we all have different personalities. Sooner or later, someone's going to let you down. You're going to let someone down. You're going to bump heads. It's going to happen. If you can't work it out amongst yourselves, come talk to me. We will work it out together. I promise. Life's too short. It's way too short. And I guarantee, you know what I always think? That person that I bump heads with, I always think, that's who, exactly who God's going to plant me right next to up in heaven. <laughs> exactly. He's going to say, yep, you bumped heads with that person. We're going to put you right here. Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 34, you brought, you brought of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. When you live in a community with other Christians, like I said, you're going to bump heads. And what spills out of you is what's in your heart. God uses our interactions with others to show us areas that we need to work on, that we can repent, that we need to be more Christ-like in. But we need to be reflecting on these areas and thinking, how can I form this into the Son of God? How can I be more Christ-like in this area? Working alongside Christians in a church fellowship is a wonderful way to grow your love for God and for others. It is also God's way of showing you areas he wants you to mature in your walk with him. If you've stopped attending church because people hurt you, don't measure up to your expectations or are hypocrites. Know that the enemy has you right where he wants you. He doesn't want you to go to church. Trust me, there's days I wake up. I think every day this week I woke up with a headache and I'm like, man, I could just stay in bed today. I don't always feel like coming up here. But when I do, I am, the time I get here, and I've prayed, God's got me in the right headspace. Because Satan's goal is to divide and conquer. He wants to split you apart from the body of Christ. Keep you separate. Because when you're separate, he knows he's, you're vulnerable. He can, you're vulnerable to his schemes and his tactics. And he knows if he throws something, it's more than likely going to stick. Satan will use your lack of love for God's people to pull you away from God. If in your response to the offensive offenses of others, you've wandered away from Christ, make sure you start praying, God, I know the importance of church. I know I need to be there. But I'm struggling in the mornings to get there. I need your help. I promise you, he'll give you whatever kick in the butt to get there. Number four, the reason to come to church is to exercise your gifts. We've all been given gifts to serve the body. And like I always tell you guys, you're in this church body for a reason. God has placed you here for a specific reason. It's not an accident you come to church here. It's not. From preaching to encouraging, hospitality to administration, God equips his children with gifts gifts to serve Christ. Romans chapter 12, verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesize in accordance with your faith. When a church body is healthy, its members realize they are part of the congregation, not only to receive, but also to be a blessing. At some point in your walk, you're going to go from give me to how can I give back? Isaiah's response, here I am, send me. 
statistics show that most churches, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Our last church was over 1,000. And I saw the same people serving the same areas, serving multiple areas. Now, I'm not saying this to guilt trip you or to force you into something. Lord knows I am against anyone filling holes. If you're filling a hole, I don't want you there. Plain and simple. Filling holes keeps you from where you're called to be and keeps others that are called to that area from going. I don't care if you're called, let's say you're called to, to help back in kids' church. I'm just going to use that. And you say, well, they've got two people back there. It looks like they've got enough. Looks like they got, all, or maybe this spaghetti dinner that's coming up. They've got how many people? It looks like they have enough people to help. They ain't got no room for me. It might look that way, but I'm telling you, there is always need. There is always room for someone to help. Always. And if God's calling you there, reach out. Reach out. And if it's in God's will, we'll, we'll place you there. We will certainly encourage you and help you and support you in those areas. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, For what, what are God's handy, handiwork created in Christ Jesus to go, do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do? Like I said, many of us see work happening in the church, and we think it's all together. They don't need me. They do. Whether it's just come and chat, whether it's... You're giving gifts that maybe I'm not good at. For instance, I am horrible at administration. It is no secret. I absolutely hate it. There's other people that are better at it than me. Those are well received, I will say. If you look closely, you'll discover many individuals who are doing more work than what they would simply like to be doing. There's always room. Get involved. Jesus tells us in his day, Luke chapter 10, verse 2 tells us, he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest fields. People, the harvest is ready. People are hungry for the word of God. There is works to be done. There are many things that we can do. The problem becomes is if your willingness. There can be a thousand great ideas, but if I don't have the talents, the time of people, and the, the finance, we don't get to do these things. It is up to the congregation, the church, to be obedient and to have willingness to do what God's called them to do. Your willingness to minister in your church with what God has gifted you is likely to answer someone's prayer. It's to answer someone's prayer that to send more workers to help. It is to answer someone's prayer that they need a blessing. It is also going to answer the prayers that we've been doing every Tuesday at 7 to reach the lost. When you start giving of yourself, your time, talents, and finances, then we get to truly hit the mission field. And we truly get to reach people that don't know God. Next, kind of goes along with this, to be a light in our community is a reason to go to church. Jesus said, the world will know we are disciples by our love for one another. So, of course, Satan wants to destroy any sense of love and of community in the body. When we commit to loving God and loving others, the light shining from your Christ honoring love is what the Spirit can use to draw others to Christ. You want to know why the first church grew in numbers daily? 
Because they were willing to be obedient to God's calling. They were willing to come and meet together and be united in everything that they were doing. The ministries they had, the, the finances, the talents, the time, the meeting together to worship. They were willing to do all these things and God blessed it. And he kept sending people because he said, this is a healthy church. I can send people here and they will get the biblical knowledge. They will, get grow, they will grow with them. They will be able to lean on them. They'll be able to serve. That's what we need to do here, guys. We can always do better at it. Anyone can. We can always do better. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and be glorified and glorify your Father in heaven. Be a witness, guys, because you say you go to church, you say you're a Christian. They watch. People watch. And they're going to watch how you live your life, how you handle situations, what you do with your finances, your time, your talents. They're going to watch. And in the moment you're obedient, that spark sparks another and another. And before you know it, there'll be a revival in this town. I guarantee it. Guaranteed. Because the truth is, is everyone is looking for acceptance. Everyone is looking for a place to belong. The harvest is ready. People are hungry for the word of God, whether people want to admit it or not. They all long to know to be, to be loved and a place to belong. When God's people commit to fiercely loving each other, uniting together, coming together, using their time, talents, and finances, and forgiving each other when they do bump heads, their love will be a light that shines brightly. And all I'm asking is let it start here. Let it start here. The last reason that we should go to church is because God says to. So let us do what Hebrews 10.25 tells us. Not giving up meeting together or in some of the habit of doing, but encouraging one another at all and all the more as you see the day approaching. I want you to think of the underground churches in different countries. I remember this story of a China man. He was explaining how they had to sing hymns no louder than a whisper. We just, we could have blown the, the roof off this place today and no one would have cared. They can't sing no louder than a whisper. For fear that they would be discovered. Discovery would mean physical abuse, their children in possession seized, and imprisonment. Yet still, they didn't give up meeting together. Also in China, it's not across town. It's not 30 or 40 minutes down the road. It's 13 hours at times. And imprisonment is involved. Maybe worse, death. And yet we take for granted that we get to meet openly. We get to openly worship God together. And we take it for granted. That we get to openly share our faith. Yet so many times we make excuses. We grab at excuses not to come to church. Not to come to men's or women's group. Not to come to a prayer and worship night, not to come to a dinner, not to come to this or that, not to go serve, not to give up our finances. These people are willing to give up everything just to serve God. A few years back, there was an underground church over in Pakistan, and they were meeting in a basement of a house. And a reporter went down there from America, and they said, they said, what's your biggest fear? That we're going to be caught and killed. And they said, well, what happens? And they say, we will stand our ground and boldly say that we are followers of Jesus Christ. And I'm talking kids that are five years old, willing to stand there boldly and say, I am a follower of Jesus. 
but yet today we make excuses in America to, come, to not come to church? Think about that. We have the freedom to do that. We don't have to worry about being killed. We don't have to worry about imprisonment, anything being seized, our children being taken away. We get to openly come here anytime we want to worship. Play music and worship as loud as we want. But we take it for granted. And we make excuses not to gather together, to not to do what God has commanded us to do. I'm not telling you this to guilt trip you at all. But I hope this stirs in your hearts how valuable and what an incredible privilege it is that we have to openly meet together and worship, to come together and talk about our faith as loud as we want, whenever we want. To hear the preaching of the word without worrying about being in prison. To having Bibles that we can carry around with us anywhere we want. My prayer is that God would capture our hearts in a new and fresh way. I pray that his spirit stirs up a zeal in our church that, and of commitment to meeting together with God's people to praise him, to love others, to shine brightly. The hope of Christ to a generation who is in desperate need of it. People are hungry for the word of God and they want to hear it. Are we willing to be like those underground churches? To wrap things up, make God a priority in your life. Church is serious. It's valuable. There's strength and unity. Let's be a witness to the world. Let's not give up meeting together. If you're not a regular attendee, I want you to, I want you to pray and make that a goal. That I'm going to go to church regularly. And if you don't think you can do that without making excuses, find someone that can keep you accountable. Also, invite someone. Maybe you don't want to come to church alone. Like I told you before, 80% of people come to church because someone else invited them, not because of me. Invite someone to come with you. If you physically can't get out and you're watching online, invite someone to watch with you. If you know of someone that's watching online, make sure to point to, talk to him about the service that day. Make him a part of the community. As we're all in, God will be glorified when we are meeting together and giving of our time, our talents, and our possessions, just like he did the first church. And just like the first church, like I said, there'll be a revival and he will add to the numbers daily. Because a healthy church community attracts others to Christ. So we're going to replay a song. The altars are open. Maybe you struggle with coming to church. Maybe you can't get here all the time. Maybe you reach for these excuses every Sunday or every time there's an event or a group. Pray and ask God to help you. Maybe you struggle with sharing and inviting people. Maybe you're struggling with the finance part. If you want scriptures, I'll give you the scriptures. Pray and ask God to help you with that. It's the one area he says, trust me in. Maybe it's where to serve. There's many areas to serve in the church right now that could desperately need some help. Pray about where God is wanting you to go. What he's wanting you to do. Each one of you have talents. Share them. Maybe it's, maybe you're doing all the other things and maybe you have trouble struggling out in the, out in the world sharing your faith. Ask God to help. Ask him to use you and I promise you he will. He'll open up them doors and make them as plain as day. Ask for strength to come through them. So the altars are open. You can worship. You can come to the altar. If you don't want to come by yourself, grab someone. Drag them up here. 
Maybe you don't even have a relationship.